Hello and welcome back to the fourth lecture of the Python programming course at WHU. Today, I'm here on my own without any audience due to the coronavirus. And that's because all the lecture halls have been closed down for all the students. So I am recording this lecture today without an audience, but I hope that it's still worthwhile even though some of the interaction may be missing. So today's lecture is about recursion and about looping. These are two concepts, but they are two sides of the same coin. And usually recursion is only taught towards the end of a programming course, if at all. So why did I choose to teach recursion as a very early concept in the course? Well, I've learned um, over the years that the less a student knows about anything in regards of programming, the less confused he or she may be when being uh, confronted with topic on recursion. So just lean back and uh, I promise you that recursion will be rather easy. It will come to you almost naturally because you actually know it already. You just have not yet heard of the name recursion before. And then once we understand recursion, we will basically review the same topic just from another angle and I refer to it as looping in this lecture. And um, yeah, we will do both of this in today's lecture. So what is recursion? Well, a good way to introduce something is always with a trivial example. So we will have a trivial example here that mimics what all of you know, uh, what usually happens on New Year's Eve. So what happens, let's say 10 seconds before midnight, before the next year starts? Well, usually someone starts to count down a countdown, usually around 10. So people start to count down 10, nine, and so on. And then when midnight comes, everyone is screaming Happy New Year and congratulating each other. So how could we build such a you know, program that mimics this type of output in Python? So what you see here is a function called countdown. It takes one argument, which is called n, and n is supposed to be an integer, and it's the seconds before the party begins. So it's the seconds until midnight in our example. And then we have an if-else branch, and then let's look at the if first, the if statement, the if header line checks if n is equal to zero. And if so, there is no more number to be counted down, so we just wish each other a happy new year. In the else clause, on the contrary, we are not yet at midnight, so what we do is we just print the number that was passed to the countdown function, and then something interesting happens. The countdown function, in its last step, calls itself after decrementing n by 1. So let's say if countdown is started with, let's say, n equals 3, then countdown would be called again here with n equal to 2. So um, that is a good example of a recursion. It's an almost minimal example of a recursion. So what is recursion? Well, you should think of recursion as a function, an ordinary function in Python that somehow calls itself but also a function that has an if-else logic so that not in all cases it calls itself because a function that will always call itself under all circumstances we will soon see is uh, not a good function. So um, the, first ca uh, the first branch here, the if branch, is what we call a base case. And the base case is any, is any branch, any logical step in a function that does not lead to a call of itself. So that's the base case. And then the other case, if we only have one other case, uh, is the recursive case, the recursive step, sometimes also call, called the recursion. So I uh, define the function, and of course nothing happens. We don't have an output here because def is a statement, so it has a side effect, and the side effect is it does create a variable called countdown, and it does not yet execute the function. So in order to execute it, we just call the function with the parentheses, the call operator, and pass it, for example, the number three. So we count down from three to zero to midnight. What's the output? Well, the output is what we expect it would be. It's just saying three, two, one, and happy new year. So that's um, an easy example. The output makes sense. So is there something more to be learned here? Well, the answer is yes. and. Uh, as you know by now, in this course, I value a lot of. Um, uh, I value that you learn a lot about what's actually going on in the computer's memory, and we will see that something interesting is happening here. So I'm here on Python Tutor, and um, I copy pasted 
the code of the example here. I just left out the doc string to make it a bit shorter. And then after the de definition of the function, we call it with the same argument. So let's go through the steps. The first step is now executed. And all it did is um, it created a variable called countdown that references a, a box in memory that holds the ones and zeros, the code uh, that uh, is in the function's body. And then in our second step, we now call this function with an argument of n equals set to 3. So what happens? Well, as we have uh, seen before, a new box is now created. And this box will hold what is called the local scope of a, of a function call. And in this local scope of the function call, n is set to 3, unsurprisingly. So what happens when this function executes? Well, the if branch is skipped because n is not equal to 0. So we go to the else branch right away. And then all that happens is we print n and we will see the printed output up here. And then the function calls itself after n is decremented by 1. And then what happens? Now comes the surprise. Well, we have a second box now, which uh, is there because of another function call that is going on, a new function call. And within this new function call's local scope, n is now 2. But the important thing is, the first box did not go away yet. So the n set to 3 is still there. It's just not active. So we see the active scope is the one that is uh, in blue here in Python Tutor. But we see the old function call is still active. It's still somewhere in memory. And then what happens when the function is called with n set to 2? Well, nothing surprising happens. So we, all we do is we just print out 2 again. And then we call the function again now with n set to 1. And see, um, now we have a third function call that happens simultaneously in memory. So the first two function calls have not yet returned. And now the function is executed for n set to 1. Nothing surprising happens. 1 is printed out, and then the function is called one more time, now with n set to 0. And now we hit the base case. We hit the case where n is set is equal to 0, in which case we print out Happy New Year. Now we see it here. And now something happens that we have not seen before in this example. So now for the first time, um, after the print Happy New Year has been executed, there is no more code to be executed. Therefore, the last function call where n was set to 0 now returns. And we see this instant where a function call returns in Python Tutor um, when we have for just one step where we see the return value here. The return value is set to none. And that is, a, um, that is so because we didn't say uh, return something explicitly in the code. So whenever we don't say return something, what happens is there is an implicit return none. And we have seen none before. It's a special object, which basically means the absence of a value, but it's a value on its own. And this value is returned. And where is it returned to? Well, it's returned to the other function call where n was set to 1. So now the, uh, the last function call where n is 0 disappears. It goes away. The function has returned. It's over. And now we go back to the function call where n was set to 1. And now there's only one more step to be done, which is now, and now after countdown n minus 1 has returned, there is also not more code. So this, the next function call will also just disappear and so on. And then what we are left with at the end, in the last step, we are left with just the global name countdown pointing to the function definition. And then we see the output 3, 2, 1, Happy New Year. But we, uh, we observe that um, there were actually four uh, function calls happening simultaneously in memory. So there have been four, M, four Ns in memory simultaneously. They appeared one by one and they went away one by one. Um, so the memory consumption was rather high here, right? So uh, we had to, to we had to basically keep track of all the individual function calls. So let's go back to the presentation. So now we've understood a simple example of a recursion. And now you may wonder, well, that's nice, but you know what can I need it? For? What can I do with it? What what uh, can I do with recursion that I couldn't do? You know otherwise, or what is a, an example that is realistic and not so trivial? Well, as I said, you know recursion already. You know it actually for quite some time. Usually around 10th grade, maybe 11th grade in math in high school, 
um, you learn something that is called the factorial of a number. And you usually do so in a, in a discipline called combinatorics um, that has to do with probability theory and so on. You may remember, you may not like it, but uh, you've definitely heard of it before. And uh, so the factorial is one very popular example. And I uh, say here it's an easy example, easy because I think uh, it's rather easy to understand because all you need to understand is the following. This is the definition. So the definition says that n factorial is defined as n times and then n minus one factorial again. And in the case where n equals zero, then the zero factorial is defined to be one. So let's assume um, you want to calculate the factorial of the number three. So how do you do that? Well, the factorial of the number three would be three times two times one, and that is six. So now um, I did something that is usually done in math. I counted backwards. So when you calculate factorial of, let's say five, you would, you would go ahead and, and say five times four times three times two times one, and that's it. Now, the thing is multiplication is symmetric. So we could also have said one times two times three is also equal to the factorial of three or one times two times three times four times five is also equal to the factorial of five. It doesn't matter in which order we go. And um, this observation will become uh, important later on. But here uh, on the slide, we see the generic case and the generic case may not be so readable for anyone right away, but I think it's also rather easy. And uh, so, but the thing is, um, how do we, how, what can you now do with that? How can we translate this into Python, into code? And the thing is this, it's rather easy because it basically is already uh, screaming at us. So, so let's go ahead and define a function that I call factorial. It takes one n as the argument, which is the factorial of the number we want to, the, the, or is the number, the factorial of which we want to calculate. It, it should be an integer. Um, it's technically possible to, uh, to calculate factorials with non-integer numbers. However, that would require some higher math and we don't want to do that here. And then um, we have a very um, easy if-else logic again, which mimics exactly what the definition of the factorial says. Well, first, we say here, the factorial of zero is defined to be one. Well, that's not a natural law. That's something mathematicians made up. It, it makes sense, philosophically speaking, but it's definition. It's nothing that, you know, you know, has to be discovered or something. It's just something that um, mathematicians uh, assume to be true. And how can we put this in the code? Well, we just say, well, if we call the factorial function with n equal to zero, then we just return the number one because that's the, the, the definition. You know, that's the, the factorial of zero is just one. And now here, that's a, also a difference to the uh, aforementioned a trivial example of the countdown. Now here we see an explicit return statement. And uh, what that means is we don't return none once the function call ends, but we return the number one in this case. And because in this if branch, the function factorial does not call itself, it's the base case. And then what do we do if we are not in the base case? Let's say if we want to calculate the factorial of three, what would happen? Well, what we would do is, we would do what is called the recursive step. So what we do is we call factorial, so factorial calls itself with n decremented by one. So if, let's say in the example, I call factorial of three, then here we would call factorial with n set to two. And whatever we get back from here, we store in the variable called recurse. And then in the next step, we say the actual result that we care about is not just recurse. It's not just the, the thing that is here in the parentheses, it's n times this recurse value. So in other words, if we look up here to the mathematical definition, we also have a base case. And then we say um, n, the factorial is defined as n times n minus one factorial. So in other words, the factorial is defined in terms of a factorial. And usually in, uh, in school, in high school, we are taught in usually in uh, language classes that it's not a good thing to define something in its own words, to define something with itself, basically by referring it to itself. Um, Self-referential um, definitions, they are basically pointless, right? Um, however, 
um, we are not in traditional language studies here, we are programmers and programmers, uh, as you may have noticed already, are able to think outside the box and formulate things outside the box a little bit. So we are as programmers actually able to reference, um, to have a self-referencing referencing function definition. So um, that's it. And so we see the recursion actually also in the mathematical definition. And up to now, I suppose you have not yet heard the term factorial, uh, the, the term recursion, but basically um, you have known it already. And now let's define the function factorial. And now let's check if it works. So let's call a factorial with the argument of three and we get back six. Why? Well, because the factorial of three is just three times two times one, which is six. It works. So now let's make the function a little bit nicer. What do I mean with that? Well, let's go back one more time to the actual factorial function. We have an explicit if else logic here. So what, I, what do I mean with explicit? Well, we both we say we write out if something and else. Now, um, and also what we see here is in both cases, we return, right? So if we hit the if clause, we have we hit the return as well. If we hit the else clause, we hit the return as well. And you know, you remember from the chapter on functions that after we hit a return statement, there is nothing that will be executed after it anymore. So even if, even if I have, let's say another uh, line of code here, let's say one plus one, this would not, this would never be executed, right? After return statement, um, there is nothing that will be executed. In other words, if we go into the if branch and hit the return, there is no way anything that is below here, including the else, can be hit. In other words, um, since we have a binary choice between if and else, between just two branches, what we just do in the revised version here is we just check for the base case for n equals to zero, in which case we just return one. But if we don't hit this case, we don't need an else here. We can just say return something because we know if we had hit the, the if branch, then we wouldn't be down here to begin with. So we don't have to care about the else here anymore. And then what we do is in the old version, um, I called, I made the recursive function call to factorial of n minus one, and I stored the result in a variable called recurse. And then in the second step, I calculated the actual result that we care about. And then in the third step, I returned it. So let's go ahead and put all those three steps into one. How do we do that? Well, I just say return, and then we can, after the return statement of the return keyword, we can put basically any expression, any legal expression syntactically. So for example, n times the return value of factorial n minus one would be an expression. So uh, we don't need to have any uh, variable that we assign to in this case here. We can just return the expression right away and it will be evaluated at runtime when the function is called. Um, and then whatever is calculated here will be returned right away. We don't need any more variables. So, um, so there are actually two improvements, right? The first one is we can skip the else. And the second one is we can all skip all the temporary variables. And whenever we see this, this pattern, uh, this has the name, it's the so-called early exit pattern. Why early exit? Well, because if we hit the if, we exit from the function called early and um, then the, 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 any line that comes after return cannot be hit, it cannot be executed. Therefore, we exit from the function called early. And uh, this is something not every language uh, supports, but in Python, it's easy uh, to implement this. And I think this makes reading the function even nicer, right? Um, it, it, we are now as close as it can, can get to um, the mathematical definition where we said factorial of, of zero is one. And if it's not zero, it's just n minus the factorial of n minus one. We couldn't get any closer to the function to the function definition. And then of course, it's always a good idea if you, um, if you refactor a function to just uh, check if it still works and factorial of three is still six. So it seems that we have not made any mistake here. That's uh, the factorial. So now we have seen a realistic example. And now I want to show you, and this is just mainly for illustration, an example of a recursion that is not so easy to see. And it's an old algorithm, it's called Euclid's algorithm, and I call it an involved example because it's really not so easy to see why the following works. So what Euclid uh, discovered was, 
If you want to uh, calculate the greatest common divisor of two numbers, let's call them a and b, you can do that using uh, a recursion. So uh, we see the recursion because there is an if branch here and we return from it, from it and then there is an, expl an implicit else clause here. So we have an if else logic and in the else clause here, the function gcd for greatest common divisor calls itself. And it does not call just uh, itself with a and b, it calls itself with b in the place of a. And in the place of the former b, we, call, we have a modulo divided by b. And um, this is not something that, you know, we would suspect, right? I mean, this is not something that we can intuitively say that has to be, this has to work like this. And um, however, Euclid discovered that a um, very long time ago. And then the modulo div uh, division that we've also seen before, we have seen it with three different use cases, actually. Um, what, we, what, what the modulo division does is, let's say A and B are very big numbers. The modulo division makes the result very small. And uh, in other words, and in other words, it's a very fast operation. And uh, what we will see here, that Euclid's algorithm to calculate the greatest common divisor of two uh, whole numbers is not just uh, possible to formulate it in a recursive way, but it's also uh, an algorithm that is very, very fast. So, for example, the greatest common divisor of 12 and 4 would be 4, because 12 is divisible by 4, it would also be divisible by 2 and 6 and 12, of course, uh, but 4 is only divisible by 1, 2 and 4, so 4 is the greatest common divisor. And then that's what I just meant but with the speed that comes from the modulo division. So here I have two very large numbers and I want to find the greatest common divisor, a whole number. Um, and I execute it and it's 9. So I don't know if, it, if 9 is correct, it's hard to, to validate this. Um, especially with what we know, what we remember from elementary school, because I think in elementary school, all of us had to calculate greatest common divisors of two numbers. And here for, for such big numbers, we didn't do that by hand back in the days. But let's assume this is correct. And you can uh, believe me, it is correct. The thing is, it's a very fast calculation. And then of course, um, if um, you, if we now now we called the function with two numbers in two in two examples where we know um, there is a greatest common divisor and we we calculated it, and let's uh, put a third example here where we also know what the example what the result is supposed to be. I use the numbers two and seven thousand nine hundred and nineteen. So you might wonder what is so special about the number seven thousand nine hundred and nineteen. Well, it's the one thousandth prime number. And what we know from uh, back in high school and maybe also elementary school, prime numbers have the property that any two prime numbers, they don't really have a greatest common divisor, right? The greatest common divisor among prime numbers is one. That's what the function output is. So um, this is also a way to check a corner case uh, when, we, uh, when we create a new function, we should all, always check corner cases and a corner case for the greatest common divisor function would always be uh, to check it with two prime numbers and see if the, the returned value is one. So that was just uh, to show you that recursion can do magic things and it's not so easy to, you know, think it up basically. It's not so easy as maybe in the factorial case. So let's find, let's look at another case that is uh, not so well known outside mathematics and computer science, but it's an example that uh, some of you may know from Hollywood movies, um, where usually when uh, in Hollywood movies, the Roman Catholic Church is involved in some movie and there is some quiz to be solved, usually it is about Fibonacci numbers. So um, many, many people use Fibonacci numbers if they need some quiz to be, to be solved. And it shouldn't be a, a quiz that um, yeah, that uh, is very common. And also the Fibonacci numbers, they also are used in, uh, in uh, art, for example, or in geometry. So when artists paint paintings and they ask the question, you know, in what um, ratio should certain uh, elements be, then usually they use what is uh, called the golden ratio. And the golden ratio in art uh, also comes from the Fibonacci numbers. So Fibonacci numbers, even though um, 
as business people, maybe uh, you won't find them quite useful. It's a very useful example to know. So what are Fibonacci numbers? Well, here's an example of a Fibonacci series. It's the first 13 Fibonacci numbers. And Fibonacci numbers are defined as follows. The first two Fibonacci numbers, they are just defined as a zero and one. So those first two numbers, they are just given. It's just like the factorial of zero is defined to be one. That's just a given, we have to accept it. And then the rule is this. The next Fibonacci number is always the sum of the previous two numbers. So in this case, we have zero plus one coming from the left side, zero plus one is equal to one. And then we have one plus one is equal to two. And then we have one plus two is equal to three and so on. And towards the end, we have 55 plus 89, and this will be equal to 144. So now I did, I did something that, you know, seems intuitive. I went from the left to the right. However, um, we are here in a chapter on recursion. And recursion usually means, in a naive way, to solve a problem from the end and not from the, from the beginning. So how can we view this problem as a problem coming from the right direction? Well, we can say, if we wanted to calculate this Fibonacci number and we didn't know it was 144 yet, what we do know is it's the sum of the previous two. So the problem of finding the 13th Fibonacci number can be reduced to the problem of finding the 11th Fibonacci number and the 12th Fibonacci number and then adding them, right? And now let's see at some code. Let's see a Python function that does exactly what I just said uh, previously. What this function does, it takes one argument called i, and by i usually I mean an index. So previously I used n for uh, a number, and now or a and b for number, and now I use i for index. So index is a little bit something else. And then what we do is the function, it returns the i-th Fibonacci number. So if I want to calculate the 13th Fibonacci number, i would be 12, right? Because we start counting at zero. So Let's see what the code does. Well, now, first of all, see we have three return statements, three times the word return. So that is something new. We have not not seen this before. Before that, we only had two different returns. Now, in the first case, I say, if i is equal to zero, just return zero. What that means is if I am asked to calculate the first Fibonacci number, which, which is index zero, I just return zero. Why? Because it's uh, by definition. You know, so it, there's nothing to be calculated here. If my problem is to calculate the uh, Fibonacci number with the index i equals one, the second Fibonacci number, then the number will be one by definition. So notice that is the same idea of a base case, just as we had in the factorial, where I said, well, um, the factorial of zero is defined to be one, right? there's nothing to calculate. And because there is nothing to calculate, I can just return the value as is. And that is a base case, because I don't call Fibonacci it itself. Fibonacci does not call itself in the first and the second branch here. And so this is also a different uh, scenario now. Before that, we only had examples where there was exactly one base case. Now we, we see an example where there are two different base cases. And then in the last step, which is basically like an else, so this could also, we could have written here, we could, or could also write just else and then return like this, but then using the early exit pattern that I mentioned before, we just leave away the else and put the return on the same intendation as the if and the elif. And then what we do is this, we say the i-th Fibonacci number, so let's say the 13th Fibonacci number, is just the sum of the i minus one plus the Fibonacci number i minus two. So in other words, I just specify a rule as to how to calculate a Fibonacci number given its two predecessors. So the 144 is the sum of the 55 plus the 89. So we are calculating the Fibonacci number from right to left here. And um, now you may wonder, is it always possible to, to calculate the solution to a problem both in a forward and be in a, back, in a, in a backward uh, direction? Usually this is the case. And usually one of the two cases is easier than the other, but usually um, you have to, it's not as easy that uh, to say that both cases, both directions are equally good. 
So uh, we will see that calculating Fibonacci numbers from, from backwards, from coming from the right side, is actually not a good um, thing to do. But that's exactly why I put it here, to show it to you, to, to show you why a recursion, even though it may seem intuitive in the, in, the, uh, in the factorial case, may be not so easy to understand in the Fibonacci case. But I think the logic is clear. We go from right to left and uh, we reduce a big problem the, to finding the highest Fibonacci number into two smaller problems, finding the Fibonacci numbers for index i minus one and i minus two. So let's define the function and go ahead. And then let's calculate the 13th Fibonacci number with index 12 and we get the number 144. So I just said that calculating the Fibonacci numbers from right to left is not the best thing to do. Why is that? Well, there is a topic that we have not yet talked about in this course, which is a topic on efficiency of algorithms. So uh, what I mean by efficiency of algorithms is we want to, you know, all code that we write will run very fast for small inputs. But the question we usually are interested in is what happens if my problem becomes big? So instead of finding the 13th Fibonacci number, maybe I want to find the 1000th Fibonacci number. So instead of a factor or, um, you know, an order of magnitude of 10 or in the tens, I now want to find, uh, now my problem scales up to the order of magnitudes of thousands or maybe ten thousands and so on. And the question I ask is, what happens to the speed? So if, let's say, um, uh, here's an example. Let's say um, I want to go ahead and calculate the 13th Fibonacci number with index 12. What I can do is I can uh, use the time it magic here and time the function. So what this code here does, the, the uh, double percent sign time it and the dash n 100 means this cell is now run 100 times and then the, the run time is averaged and the standard deviation is taken. So on average, um, running this cell, running Fibonacci of 12, uh, takes uh, 43 microseconds. So that's micro. And uh, for those of you who don't know what micro means, it means times 10 to the power of negative six. So we shift the, the, the period point by six digits here. And then we ask the question, what happens if I want to calculate the Fibonacci number, the 25th Fibonacci number, so Fibonacci of 24, index 24. So what we see here is first, the problem size doubles. So the input before was 12, now the input is 24. So in that regard, in regard to the index, our input now doubles. Now what happens to runtime? It would be natural to assume that if you solve a problem that is twice the size of another problem, we would need twice the time, right? So let's see what happens to runtime. I execute the cell and it still calculates as we see, it takes very long time. And now it's done. And we see here on average, we have 100 calls here, 100 times we ran this cell. On average, one run takes 13 milliseconds. And so now you may wonder what is milli? Well, milli is um, times 10 to the negative three. So on average, if we disregard the 40 and the 10, let's say if we just look at the micro and the milliseconds, that means the second cell on average is slower by a factor of 1000. So by just doubling the input, the, the runtime of the algorithm goes up by a factor of 1000. So that's a very weird and also bad behavior. And now let's do this one more time. Let's do this for Fibonacci for the 37th Fibonacci number, which is uh, Fibonacci with an I of 36. And now see here, I only run uh, this cell once because running it 100 times then we would you know sit here for an hour just watching the cell run So now I, I run this cell just once and let's see how long the cell takes So it's 4.2 seconds. So disregarding the exact numbers in the front We just look at the the order of magnitude here So we look at the micro the milli and then here is no prefix here. So we are talking seconds here so again from going from uh, Fibonacci 24 to Fibonacci 36, there is another uh, slowdown of a factor of around about 1000. So um, in other words, calculating Fibonacci of 12 and calculating Fibonacci of 36 um, has you know, a difference in runtime if we scale it up by 1 million.
So to calculate Fibonacci of 36 is like 1 million times more expensive or 1 million times slower than calculating Fibonacci of 12. And um, yeah, so you may wonder what's going on here. And then, of course, how can we how can we analyze this? Well, um, what we do here, we go into a Python Tutor, and we just copy paste the code here into Python Tutor, and I calculated for Fibonacci of five, but that's enough. It's a small problem size here, but it's enough to see what the problem actually is. So let's see what happens in memory. Well, first we create a new function called Fibonacci. And now we start calling it for i equals 5. And now what happens for i equals 5? Well, the if and the elif branches, they are skipped because the conditions are not true. So we go to return Fibonacci i minus 1 plus Fibonacci of i minus 2. So what happens is, before this function can actually return, it will call Fibonacci again, now with i equal to 4. And now i equal to 4 runs. But remember, the i equal to 5 function is still running. It's still running. And let's go on. And now what happens when i is equal to 4? Well, um, this function goes until the return statement here and then calls return Fibonacci of 4 minus 1, which is 3. So now we call Fibonacci of 3 again. And now we go down. And now we call Fibonacci with i equals 2. And now for the first time, um, with our fifth overall function call, we call Fibonacci, where i is equal to 1. And now that i is equal to 1, there is no more function call because that's a base case. So we hit i is equal to 1 and we return 1 right away. We see this here. The return value of 1 goes, goes back to the previous function call. Now what does the previous function call do? Well, the, the previous function call, if I go back one here, where we have i is set to 2. This now has evaluated the left-hand side of the plus here. And now what, we sh what happens is, now this part has returned. Now the right part has also to be executed. And now for the right part, Fibonacci is uh, 2 minus 2, which is 0. So this is why we see Fibonacci of i equals 0 here. Now this is executed. Good for us that Fibonacci of i equals 0 is also a base case. So we also return 0 here, right? return zero. And now, finally, after having executed Fibonacci of i minus one, and also executed Fibonacci of i minus two, we have both return values. And now we can actually return this function call. So now the function call where i was set to two can finally return after having made two more function calls. And now this goes back. But now what's the problem? The problem is, now we have to evaluate the right-hand side of the last line for the previous function call where i was set to 3. And now the right-hand side, so let's go back one more time, um, the case where Fibonacci was called with i equals to 3, it called Fibonacci where i is equal to 2. Now, now that this returned, um, the right-hand side executes and Fibonacci is called again with i set to 1. But wait a minute, i is set to 1, have we caught this before? Let's go back in the let's go back some steps and we'll see that yes, we have actually called Fibonacci with i set to 1 before. And now if you go back into the future, so to say, some steps forward, we will call Fibonacci with i set to 1 again. And let's let's play this game further. Let's just go ahead and now we go back to Fibonacci where i is set to 3. And this now calls i two, but, and this also calls i with one. So again, that's now the third time that we call Fibonacci with i set to one, the third time already. So see the, see the, the, the problem here. Um, whenever, for every function call we make, no matter where we are in the chain, two more function calls will be made, unless we are in the base case, of course. But as long as we're not in the base case, every function call we make will result in two more function calls. That's an example of exponential growth because for every call we make two more will be made and for two more that will be made four more will be made two for each so in other words um, there is literally a gazillion of function calls being made in the background and just to calculate the fifth or fibonacci the fourth fibonacci no, no the sixth fibonacci number where i is set to five it requires already 70 steps and um, it's as we see if, if i click through it here we see that function calls and new function calls are made, they return, 
and then a new one is made and it goes the, the recursion tree so to say goes up and down that's what we say so it takes a long time to calculate Fibonacci with i set to 5 and that's the problem here and the problem is so we can also visualize it here maybe if I go back in the slides where we see the numbers so in order to calculate the 144 I have to calculate the 55 and the 89 however in order to calculate the 89 I have to calculate the 34 and the 55 so for every function call I, go, I make going from right to left I have to make two more that's a big problem now writing the numbers down like here also suggests to us what is the solution to the problem the solution is simply to just calculate the Fibonacci numbers from left to right that's way easier it's way f uh, way faster because we can just always take two numbers add them together get the next one add them, those two together and get the next one and so on we will see an example of going from left to right at the end of this chapter today but for now uh, we view the problem from you know right to left in the recursion way but um, we see that sometimes so what what can we say as a intermediate result well our as an intermediate result we can say we like recursion already because in some cases like the factorial case recursion is very natural to formulate it's basically like writing math and it's also fast however in some cases factor, uh, the recursive way really breaks down um, because we calculate the same you know the same function call over and over again but we will find ways to deal with that uh, in, a, in a future in a future chapter and uh, for now we just take this as given and uh, look at some more cases some more things to know about recursion so what we have seen right now was a case where we get two more function calls for every function call we make so that's exponential growth it's bad another thing that's bad is when the number of function calls doesn't even stop it just goes on forever we call this an infinite recursion so what's an infinite recursion I also give you a very trivial example here an example that is so trivial that you you should uh, never do this in practice I define a function called run forever and all it does the only line of code this function executes ever is run forever so this function calls itself and that's pointless right um, but it's just a trivial example to show you what can happen so I, I uh, define this function and now let's call it let's call run forever what do you think happens well in the worst case scenario my computer will now die and the presentation is over the recording is over but I will do it anyways in the hope that my computer won't die and it won't because Python is luckily smart enough to see that I messed up the code I have a function that calls itself over and over and over again it, that never stops and Python being smart enough figures that out and then basically interrupts this uh, function this infinite number of function calls and it gives me a recursion error so recursion error is an it's a dedicated error type that basically says well whatever you programmed um, it kept on calling itself and calling itself and never stopped and um, yeah that's it so it's like a fail safe system here so that our computer does not die now that was a trivial example um, an example where you where there was a mistake and I'm sure that in a, in a real world scenario you wouldn't make this type of mistake but how can we run into an infinite recursion without making this mistake on purpose well it's very easy to do actually let's just call the introductory countdown example with 3.1 the float 3.1 instead of the integer 3 what happens well let's see what happens the function still executes and at some point it stops and we can already see with the output what went wrong here so our countdown function starts counting down at the number 3.1 and the next number would be 2.1 and so on and then it misses the zero right it goes from 0 0.1 to minus 0 0.9 it misses the real zero the 0, 0.0 and then the countout function just keeps on running, calling itself, decrementing the number by one, and it never hits the new year case. And then if I scroll down, at some point um, in my version of Jupyter Notebook, the, the, the output is limited. So here it stops at negative 179. 
um, you can believe me that this would have run until around about 3000. So around about negative 3000, that's the limit. And then Python luckily throws a recursion error because it, it sees, okay, this function, the countdown function is now calling itself over and over again, and um, it will never stop. And then Python steps in and stops it. Of course, even without output, without printing output, we can also run into the exact same problem by calling factorial with 3.1, the float 3.1. So if I execute this, I won't see any output for a while. And then at the end, I will still see the recursion error. So um, just because I don't print out any output, um, this doesn't mean that the recursion error does not happen. So the question is now, what is actually the problem here? The problem here is that we made some assumptions about what the user would enter into our function call. In particular, we wrote both countdown and also factorial to take integer as arguments and not floats. It would still work with floats if the float were, let's say, 3.0, then the function would still work fine. But if we have any float number that does not end with a dot O, then uh, we will run into an infinite recursion. So the problem here is um, not that we, um, the problem is really not that we messed up the code. The problem is really that the user of our function messed up the function call. And what do you do in such a situation? If you make the assumption that a user of your function, maybe yourself, enters an integer and the user may not do that, how can you force your user to enter an integer if you need it? Well, you can check the input. You can do what is called type checking. So in, in the case of floats and ints, we check, uh, for example, is the argument passed in an integer type? And then also uh, a related topic, very similar topic, is called input validation. So assuming that the type of the, of the argument passed into a function is correct, it could still be wrong. So for example, what would happen um, if I asked you to calculate the factorial of, let's say, negative 10? You know, you can, it, it's, a, it's a whole number, so the type would be correct, but calculating the factorial of a negative number, we don't know what to do here in this um, introduction course. So how can we implement um, type checking and input validation in our examples? So let's see the factorial example again. Now it's a bit longer, but it's um, usually it's still very easy. So the thing that is new in the doc string it's just this section where it says raises, and then it mentions two different type of errors, a type error and a value error, and then a short description of when we will see this error. So the type error we will see if n is not an integer, and the value error we will see if n is negative. Because as I said, a negative factorial, yeah, it, um, we would have to ask a real mathematician of, of uh, what should happen then. And then maybe we can find a way to make it work. But for our simple example, we will not accept a negative number. And then you, you may wonder, you know, how do you know what type of error you should, you know, raise? Raise is a technical term. It means throw an error. That's another word that basically means just um, give the user an error. Um, and then so for a beginner, it's not so important that you write uh, the that you write down the right error here, and whenever you are unsure of which error you should use, you can always write simply the most generic one, which is runtime error. Runtime error, as we've learned in the in the very first chapter, is at an error where syntactically the code is correct, but something other than this goes wrong. Some you know value is wrong or something goes wrong. Some user input is invalid, whatever. So runtime error is the most generic uh, type of error in this regard. And type error and value error are more specific. And uh, as a professional software developer, you should have good error messages. So you should have correct error messages, specific error messages. But as a beginner, if you write your own first couple of problems and you don't know what type of error to raise, you can always raise a runtime error. And let's see now in the code how we detect those cases. Well, um, at first, we have the first if statement, the first, head, the, the first branch. It says, if not if instance n, comma int, then raise type error. And then we have an error message here, which is a string. So what is is, is instance? Is instance is a function that gives you back either true or false 
And uh, what it does is it takes two arguments. It, the first one is any object you want. So maybe let's uh, see what the documentation says. The, the Python documentation on, on is instance, if we go here, it says is instance, it takes any object. So object basically means anything. And class info is an object that we referred to in an earlier chapter as a constructor. So we have the int constructor, the float constructor, the str, the string constructor, and so on. And that's what class info is. What the term class means, we will learn later in the course. But for now, just uh, use uh, what we understand as a constructor. And then it returns either true or false. True in the case that the object is of the type uh, that is passed in second, and false if the object is not of the type of the second argument. So let's go back into the slides. So this reads as if int is not an integer, then do this, then do this branch. And then what do we do in this branch? Well, we raise, raise is a keyword. It's a, the raise statement. And the raise statement basically raises an arrow. That's where the term comes from. And then we just raise the type arrow. We have seen type arrows before, and now we raise it on our own. And then we put a, a custom message here where we say, well, user, the factorial is only defined for integers. And then the second branch, the, the elif n smaller than zero, it just checks if the user passed in, or a factorial was called with an n smaller than, uh, smaller than zero. Because we know that down here in the, in the section that I just marked, we know for sure that uh, n must be an integer, otherwise we would be in the race in the race um, race type arrow branch here. So we know that n is definitely an integer down here. Because of that, I can check, I can compare it to zero. And if n is smaller than zero, strictly smaller than zero, I just say, well, raise a value error because the factorial is not defined for negative integers in our example. And then in the next branch, the elif branch, this is the actual um, the actual base case. So the first two branches here, they are really uh, type checking and input validation. And then the third branch is the actual base case, the actual first branch. You could also write, you know, sometimes you could just write if and maybe put a space, an empty, spa an empty line in there to, um, to show that up here we do the input and type checking and down here we have the actual code. But syntactically, the, cons the most concise way to write this program is to just use three branches and then use the early exit pattern again at the end. So if we hit the base, the base case where n is zero, then we just return one because the factorial of zero is one. And in the case where we call factorial with an n, that is an integer, and also uh, strictly greater than zero, then we are down here. Then what we do is we return n times the factorial of n minus one. So the logic remains the same. All we do is we add the um, type checking and input validation up here. Let's define the function. And now what we can do is we can call factorial, for example, with zero. It will give us one, so it works. We can call factorial with three, which we did before. We get back six because the factorial of three is just three times two times one, which is six. And then we can do the following. We can call factorial, for example, now with a float, 3.1. And what we get is a type error. Why do we get a type error? Well, we specified it to be a type error. And we also see our custom error message here. Factorial is only defined for integers. Technically speaking, I could also call factorial now with some text and I will also get this message. So any type, any data type that is not int will lead to the type error here. Similarly, if I call factorial now with an integer that is negative, I will also get an error, but now I get our value error that we specified because we said factorial is not defined for negative numbers, for negative integers. And this way, we, what, we, what we achieve is twofold. Well, we make sure that um, a, if a, a user does not use our function the way we want him or her to, they get a, a specific, a custom error message. However, um, to be yeah, however, uh, we should also mention that um, we are not really responsible for, for, for uh, checking the input because we actually tell the user already, hey, give me an integer that is positive. But if a user does not read the doc string, then we are kind enough to um, not have our code run into an infinite recursion and um, we, by raising an error. 
So that's the second advantage of our of our new code that we prevent an infinite recursion. The infinite recursion would be bad because if we ran this code on a on a production server, then you know we we don't want this. We don't run. We don't want to risk that our production server would uh, runs into an infinite recursion. It's just not a good thing. So it's better to put in the input validation here, even though it's four lines of code. And uh, even though it's documented that the user should not pass in a negative value, but we just may, we, it's like a fail safe system here. Okay, that now concludes the first part uh, of today's lecture. And as I said, uh, today's lecture can really be seen as two sides uh, of the same coin. And now the coin that is called recursion is now over. And now we look at the other side of the coin and I, I call this looping. Um, sometimes the more technical term would be iteration, um, but uh, I prefer it, uh, looping because iteration, in a, in a sense, in my opinion, is also recursion. You know, recursion is just looping from back, from the back, and looping is looping from front, from the beginning. So um, in both directions, we iterate, we loop, so it depends on how we use the words. And I personally prefer to use the word recursion if I mean I go backwards, in a, in a backwards uh, direction over some problem and I prefer the, the term looping if I to mean uh, to go uh, and view a problem from the beginning to the end. So what is looping? First and foremost, you have already seen a for loop. You have seen many examples of a for loop and uh, the for statement basically exists in almost any language. Now the for loop in Python is what is called syntactic sugar. So we don't really need it. It's there to make some situations, some common situations nicer for us. The more generic way of looping in Python and also in other languages would be the while statement. So let's look at a while statement. So what I do here in the second part of this lecture is I look at all the examples from the first part and I provide you with a formulation with a loop. It could be a while loop or a for loop. So what we do here is look at the countdown example again from the beginning and we rewrite it using a while loop. So now here's our revised version of countdown. First, what changed? Well, we also do some input validation here. So I, I included the races here in the doc string. I included the, uh, the type checking here. I included the input validation. So in order for the countdown to make sense, it must be strictly positive here. And then we go to the actual code and the actual code is down here. So anything that is above, you can for now ignore. If you want to understand the while statement, only the, the thing down here matters. So what happens if the function is called with valid input? Let's say n set to three. If we count down from three to happy new year, then what happens is this. We hit the while loop, the while statement, and the while statement is very similar to the if statement in that it has a condition here. So a condition means it's a Boolean expression, meaning it's evaluated and at the end of the day, it returns either true or false. And we've also seen before that in the case where a true or false is not returned, then um, we Python does um, um, what is called um, it, what, what is called um, evaluating a non-Boolean um, expression in the Boolean context. And this is when we used the terms truthy and falsy in the last lecture. So, but here we get actually back a true or false. So what is this? This says while n not equal to zero. And let's say I assumed that I called the function with n is set to three. So that means n is now not equal to zero. So the, the result of the condition would be true. What happens? Well, just as we saw with the if statement, the, the while statement here has now an indented block. So what happens if the condition is true is this code that is indented here is executed. So what we do here is we just print out n. So let's say n was three, so we just print out three. And then what we do here is we change the n, we decrement it by one. And that's important. If we did not change the n inside the loop, then this condition would never change. It would be either only false or only true. Only one of the two cases, it would never change. And that would mean we would either never run this loop or we would always run this loop. That would be kind of, of an infinite loop example. So it's important that we make sure that within the body of the while loop, we do change some variables that are also referenced 
in the condition up here so that this condition potentially changes. And by starting with a positive integer, n, I mean down here after the input validation, we know n is a positive integer. We know for sure that by decrementing any positive integer, no matter how big it is, by one, in steps of one, we will at some point hit the zero. We will at some point hit exactly zero because we, we know for sure it's not a float. We know it's an int, it's bigger than uh, zero, it's strictly positive. So at some point by executing those three lines of code, the while statement and its body, the n will hit zero eventually. And what will happen then? Well, first we started with n is set to three. So after decrementing n the first time, n is two. So then we compare here two is not equal to zero and two is not equal to zero is true. So we will go through the loop again, print out two, decrement n again, then n becomes one. Then we are up here, then we compare one to zero and it's not equal to, so the condition is still true. We print one and then we decrement n one more time and, and then now it's zero. And then the first line will say uh, zero not equal to zero and zero not equal to zero will be false. Therefore, the, the condition is false. And what happens then is once the condition is false, the, the false statement is over. So the first time this condition is false, we will basically um, jump uh, to the next line of code after the while statement. So also note that if this condition were false the first time around, we would never ever even execute this body here. And But however, this cannot happen here because the case where n is equal to zero is already excluded up here. So we know for sure that n is strictly positive. That means we know that the while statement is executed at least once. And then what happens is after the while statement, all we have to do is print Happy New Year. And conceptually, what we see here is that the base case and the base, uh, base cases in the recursion examples were usually in the beginning of the if-else logic. We, would be, we could also reformulate it so that the base cases go always last. This is always possible. You can always exchange the order of an if and else statement by just negating the condition. But usually in recursions, the base cases go somewhere, somewhere in the front. And in the looping version, uh, the base case usually goes somewhere to the end. That's a, a difference. But other than that, that's it. That's the while. That's the while loop. That's all you need to know. So the only thing you need to know is we, we, we write while a condition, so long as the condition is true, we execute the body. Once the condition is false, we don't execute it, that's it. And, now, and then of course, if I call the new countdown function again, I get the exact same output as before. Let's see one difference in memory. So here in Python Tutor, I have uh, here um, the looping version, the while loop version of countdown. and um, Let's go in and execute it. Well, first we create the new revised version of countdown in memory, and then we execute it. And then what happens is the function is called and one box is created where n is set to three. And now uh, we hit the while loop. So it says while n not equal to zero, print n. So n is not equal to zero. So therefore we print n, we print three. Now we decrement n by one, n becomes two. We see this down here. The while, uh, the while line starts running again. The condition is still true. Therefore, we print n another time. We decrement n another time. n is now one. And we do this one more time. Print the one and now n becomes zero. And now we go back to the while, to the header line of the while statement one more time. However, now the condition is false. And because of that, we jump right to the next line of code to the print Happy New Year line. Now we print Happy New Year and then the function returns and it's gone. One important difference um, to the recursive, recursive version is, I go back to the recursive version and we do this again. The recursive version, as we saw, now here's a box for the first function call where n is set to three, uh, to three. We'll now call the fu a function another time and now we have a second function call where n is equal to two. So remember, in the beginning of today's chapter, I told you that the recursive of a version of, a, of an algorithm will usually lead to several uh, simultaneous function calls in memory. So we know that uh, Python here has to really keep them separate. So Python has a lot of work to do actually. So it has three function calls happening simultaneously in the recursive version. But if I go back to the, um, to the iterative version, to the looping version, 
uh, and I run through this one more time, I don't see this. I only have one box here. So um, there is um, a big difference in memory. And this is usually a, gen a rule that generalizes. Usually a recursive version of any algorithm requires a lot more memory handling by the programming language. There are languages that optimize this, but Python doesn't. And um, so here the while loop has a big advantage in the memory. We only need one function box, only one local scope. And uh, this is not a big problem as long as we don't have lots of data. But if we have, if we work with very big um, uh, problem instances, then maybe uh, we have to, uh, maybe then, then maybe the while version would be better in memory because it only needs one local scope. But these are subtleties. Uh, for now, since you are learning um, recursion today and also looping uh, today, it's not so important to focus on the, the differences in, in memory. It's important to understand the two ideas. And again, um, the ideas, the big ideas are you can calculate most problems once from the beginning and once from the back, and usually you should end up with the same solution. Remember Euclid's algorithm, the one that you know, I formulated with um, the modular division and that was very hard to understand. So I couldn't see myself when I saw it the first time why this works actually. Um, and Euclid back, uh, back in the day, he knew that it works. And now let's look at Euclid's algorithm and formulate it with a while statement. So um, up here, the doc string is only amended with the uh, races part here. We have the input validation and the type checking. And then we have Euclid's algorithm here, and it looks totally different. Uh, I'm not going back now, but if you went back to the uh, recursive version, it's way longer here. The recursive version is a lot shorter. And then also, um, it's not so easy to read. So it says, well, I, I try to find the greatest common divisor of two numbers, A and B. And as long as A and B are two different numbers, what I do is I basically subtract the smaller one from the bigger number. and um, yeah, that's it. And I keep on doing this until A and B are the same. So I'm slowly um, decrementing the two numbers um, alternatively until they both are the same. And this number that is then the same when A and B are the same, this number is then the greatest common divisor. I also have troubles to see why this works, um, at least uh, in the short run. If you think about this, uh, I think it will make sense. But this problem, uh, even though it works and is correct, it has one other problem. Let's see what it is. Let's see. Uh, let's define the new uh, greatest common divisor function. Let's call it for 12 and 4. We know that the um, answer should be 4 because that's the greatest common divisor. And now also just to uh, sanity check the function, let's call it with two prime numbers. Um, if you call it with two prime numbers, the output would be 1. Another example of a prime number would, for, uh, for example, be 7. So the output would still be 1. So whenever we pass in two prime numbers, we get back one as the greatest common divisor that, that is to be expected. And then um, let's look at how efficient this algorithm, this um, while um, this uh, algorithm with a while loop in it works as compared to the recursive version. Remember that in the recursive version, I calculated greatest common divisor for those two numbers. And it was very, very fast. And the fact that I time it here with only one iteration of the cell, with only one execution of the cell, um, should also ma already make you think that this will take some time. And let's see. And it does take some time. And hopefully it will give me back the same result. Well, we don't see the result. It's suppressed because of the timing. But the function works. It's correct. But what we see here is that now the while loop version, the iterative, the looping version is now very inefficient and the recursive version is super efficient. So uh, when I did this lecture the first uh, time, a student came after class and said, well, is it correct that recursive version, even though it may be easier to write it down, because uh, some problems are just easier to formulate in a recursive way, is it generically so that recursive implementations may be slower than iterative versions? So in other words, the students asked me, um, is it always better to use while, even if it seems more complicated? And the answer, as we can see here, is no, it's not so easy to say. Um, sometimes the recursive algorithm is faster, sometimes the while version is faster. So it depends. And it really depends on the concrete case. 
And uh, in both cases, however, there are additional tools that we could use to, to improve the algorithms, to make them, to make them faster. But those uh, tools um, require us to know some stuff that we don't know yet. So I cannot uh, talk about this here. But for now, what we uh, summarize is this. Um, when we have a problem, we can often um, look at it from the beginning and from the end. And it's not so clear which way helps us to calculate something in a faster way. There's always a theoretically a correct answer to this. But we look at it from a pragmatic point of view, from a programming point of view. And with the tools we have learned in Python so far, um, we cannot always um, tell in advance which is the best version. Now, another um, topic, infinite loops. So we have seen infinite recursions before. And now there's also something uh, that is very similar to that, namely infinite loops. And whenever you, uh, you hear the term infinite, it's usually not good. It usually means that you have miscalculated or misprogrammed something. But you, but let's look at an example where we don't know if we um, did a mistake or not. Now you may wonder, how can I not know if, if the code that I write is correct or not? Well, let's look at an example. It's called Colas Conjecture. It's um, a mathematical problem that has been known for centuries now, or for at least uh, quite some time. And if you can answer what I'm about to tell you, you actually will win some prize money. And I think it's a lot of money actually that you can win. So even very smart mathematicians over a very long time horizon have not been able to solve the problem that I'm about to tell you here. So let's play a game. The game is this. You think of any positive integer, call it n. And then there are two rules. Well, the first one is if n is even, then you take your n and you divide it by two, and then you have the new n. If your n is odd, you multiply the old n by three and add one to it. And if an n is odd and you multiply three, it will be still be an odd number, but if you then add one, it will be an, an even number. And if you divide an even number by, or yeah, if you divide an even number by two, or by, yeah, by, yeah, by two, then sometimes you will get an even number, sometimes you will not get an even number. So what we see here is, independent of the number n that you think that you think of to, to start the problem with, um, we will get a series of n's that um, go from even number to odd number to even number and so on. So it will always iterate in, back and forth. And then the question the mathematicians ask is, if you play this game, will you always reach one? And um, what we also see here is if n is even, then the next even is defined to be half the old, even, uh, to half the old n. And that means the n is getting smaller. But on the other hand, if n is odd, and then we multiply it by 3 and add 1 to it, then that makes n bigger, right? So one step makes n smaller, one step makes n bigger. So the question is, will this, you know, uh, these steps always lead to the n equal to 1? And if you can prove that, you will make some money. Because as I said, if you can prove that mathematically, there is a price uh, on it. So let's look at this game in Python code. I define a function called callads. It takes one n. The one n it takes, the argument, is of course an integer. It must be positive. And it's the number that you think of to start the game with. Then we do some input checking. So we check if, if n is indeed an integer and strictly positive. And then we write code that goes like this. While n is not equal to 1, because that's what the assumption we want to check, then we, we, we do this. If n is even, that's if n modulo divided by 2 is equal to 0, or in other words, if n divided by 2 has no rest, then what we do is we divide n by 2. And I use the double slashes here uh, to preserve the int type. You remember, if, uh, if you divide an int by, let's say, 2, you will get back a float. But if you um, divide um, an integer with the double slash uh, operator, then whatever um, whatever remains will be an integer. It may not be the exact mathematical solution. So if you um, write seven double slash two, you will get three. So it will be rounded down. So uh, the decimals will be cut off. But if you know ahead of time that a number is perfectly divisible by two, that's what we check here for. So it's, if, if we know a number is even, then we can use the double slash operator without error. So we will get back the correct mathematical result and the type will remain an integer. If n is odd, we multiply by 3 and add 1 to it. That's it. And then in, in each iteration of the loop, 
um, we print n. And um, yeah, since it will be lots of n's, I print them on one line. And then if the loop ever ends, and we don't know this, then we also print the last number. So print n here is really print one, because down here we only reach this case, the base case, if n uh, is actually um, one. So let's let's define the function and let's call it. Let's say starting from 100. So 100 is divisible by two. So the next number will be 50. 50 is an even number. It would be divisible by two. It would be 25. 25 is not even. So we multiply by it by three to get 75 and add one to get 76. So, so let's see if that's the output we see. So as I just said, we start at 100, divided by two, divided by two, and then have, we have 25 this is times 3 plus 1, 60, uh, 76, divided by 2, 38, and so on. And then if we continue with these rules, we will end up with a 1. That's what the people want to show, but that's what nobody has proven so far. Do we always reach 1? So now what happens if I, um, if I call collapse with, let's say, 1000 as a start value? Well, the series will become a lot longer. But as we see at the end, we will also reach the number one. And now the question is this, what happens if I call collets with 10,000? Now, intuitively, the series should get longer, right? So if uh, 100 leads in these many numbers and 1000 leads to these many numbers, then 10,000 should lead to a lot more numbers, right? Unfortunately, this doesn't work. The series will become shorter. However, it will still end with a one. So the fact that um, different starting numbers will result uh, or have no, no real implication on how long the series is, the college series, this, is, this makes it very hard for mathematicians to prove that it will always reaches one and so far nobody has proven it. So um, that's a problem. I go back in the code one more time. That's a problem where we don't know if this function will end in all scenarios. So what you could do is you could write a big, big for loop and you could loop over, let's say, I don't know, 10 billion numbers, and you could call callouts with all the numbers in this for loop and see if it always terminates. And what you will see, it will terminate all the time. It will just take very, very long to do so. And um, also, we don't know, because if we if we test this number for big, big n's, we don't know what happens for n plus 1, right? So that's what, mathemat that's what mathematicians do. They want to prove it with analytical tools without um, using concrete examples. And so far, nobody has done that. So this here is more of a theoretical um, question. However, the question is important because there are some loops, some Y loops that we don't know ahead of time if they terminate or not, and we cannot even prove it. Okay. So finally, um, we introduced the for statement. And now I already told you the term syntactic sugar. So what is syntactic sugar? Syntactic sugar means that Python provides us some syntax that we some 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 uh, something that we can use in the language that is not really needed. And what do I mean by that? So we have seen two ways of looping. We have seen recursion and we have seen the while statement. The while statement allows us to build any loop we want. And the for statement is really just um, a special case of a while statement. And um, the special case is only there to make it shorter for us or more convenient for us as the programmers to write certain loops, certain loops that appear frequently in programs, but we really don't need a for statement. So that's why the for statement is syntactic sugar. So let's look at an example. Um, I define elements to be a list of the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And now I want to loop over them. And we have seen how to loop, how we loop over numbers in a list before with four. But now let's see how we can actually loop over those numbers with a while statement. So what do we have to do? Well, at first we have to uh, initialize a variable called index at zero. And then because why zero? Because we start counting at zero. And in order to get to the first number, um, we would have to write elements and then the index operator zero. So maybe um, maybe here I can show it to you. I put in one more line of code. Let's say I defined elements in the way we did above. And now I can use the index operator. Let's say with index zero, uh, now the autocomplete, 
got in the way. Elements with an index of zero gives me back zero. Elements with an index of, let's say, three gives me back three. So it's just by accident that the index will result in the number of the same, um, of the, in the same number. So if the first number were 99, then of course, index zero would, re would return would return 99 as well, right? So um, just to reiterate how indexing works. Now, we have to do this indexing in every iteration of the loop. How do we do that? We need an index number. That's why we set index to zero. And then we say, as long as uh, the index is strictly smaller than the number of elements in, in the list, so the number of elements is the which we just use We just use the len built-in function, which gives us back the number of elements in the list, so five. So as long as the index is smaller than the number of elements in the list, what we do is this. We get the next element in line by indexing into the elements list. So elements plural index, we index into it, and we get out the next element and store it in a variable element singular, right? And then I print it. I print the element because I want to see it. And at the end, in the last line of the while loop, I increment the index by one. And that makes it, uh, makes the index one in the next iteration and two in the next iteration and so on. And uh, so once the index, once we hit index equal to four, which is the last index in the, in the list, this is the last time when the condition is true. So this would be the last time this body would be executed. And then at the end, when index is increment one more time, index becomes five now. So index is now equal to the length of the elements. And because it's equal to the length of the elements, this condition would be false, in which case we jump to the end. So that's basically a for loop in a more complicated way. And then of course, the index variable, we didn't really need, right? It's a, a variable that we don't want there actually. It's only, we, we need it there to index into the list, but we don't really want this variable to exist. So what we do, we'll just delete it. We dereference it, you know? Let's execute this. And what, what gives this back is basically it, it prints out the individual elements in the list. So now how are we used to, 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 to do exactly this with less lines of code? So we are used to loop over lists with using the for statement by saying for element in elements and note that this um, the variable in the big in the in the front here can be named anything, and then we write the body of the for loop. And notice how this the body of the for loop here, the print element, is exactly the same as this. So in other words, in order to mimic this one line of code, we need one, two, three, four, five lines with a while loop. So in other words, um, the for loop saves us four lines of code. And that's all the for loop does. That's all the for loop does. The for loop has no other, um, no other thing it can do for us. And just to illustrate a point, um, this variable, I call it element singular, but now let's call it x. It also works. And um, of course, it makes sense to always use a name that makes sense here. And when we loop over elements, plural, it makes sense to call this variable element. And the variable in the for loop in the beginning here, we call this um, the, the target variable. So in a formal language, the what we are looping over here is um, yeah, it's the object is the is a so-called iterable. We will come to this uh, later today. Um, this is what we loop over, and uh, the element that we that we get in the in every iteration of the loop that this is what we call the target uh, variable. And that's how looping works. And this is uh, how the for loop is only a special case of the while loop. In other words, the for loop is syntactic sugar for the while loop. In other words, we don't need the for loop. And uh, whenever you write the for loop in Python, what you really do is you write this. It's as if Python wrote this for you. That's it. Okay, so that's the for loop. And of course, we will use the for loop heavily because most uh, most iteration logic we will implement in this course is rather simple and the for loop works. And so we always want to make the code look nice and be readable, uh, which is why we prefer to use the for loop over the while loop. But again, remember, 
that it doesn't add any functionality. That's the, that's the definition of syntactic sugar. Something that makes uh, a code to be used nicer, it makes it more readable, but it does not provide any new functionality. So um, another aside here that is important, if we look at if we look at the previous example, I defined a list in memory, and then I loop over this list. So what the first line up here does, it creates a list element on the right hand side and in memory, and then it takes and then it creates five uh, integer objects, and then inside the list it will put five references to those five integer objects. So in total, um, this um, this expression here will evaluate into six objects in memory, one list object referencing five integer objects. And then we get then, then we create an additional uh, reference from the elements variable to the list object. So we have six references, six arrows in the um, in the diagrams I used to draw. So and the important thing is they exist simultaneously. So the six objects here they exist simultaneously. Now whenever we want to iterate over a, a simplistic sequence of integers, the range built-in can help us. So what is the range built-in? So the range built-in, if we go back here to the uh, documentation, we have we see that the documentation exists twice. So there's um, the, there are two different ways of using it. The first usage for range is we just pass one number, one argument called stop. And the other one is we use either two or three variables called start, stop, and step. And um, this is um, and what what range does. It helps us to loop over the, the sequence of numbers without, and that's important, without creating all the numbers simultaneously. So while, as I said, this list here creates six objects, one list object pointing to five different integer objects, hold that meaning there are six objects in memory at the same time. What this here does, the range five only creates one object in memory that knows how to produce the next one in line. So when I loop over the range object, I have at all times, I only have two objects in memory namely the generic range object, which is kind of like a rule that knows how to create the next object without creating it. And then the for loop, which basically pulls out the next object in line one by one. So here uh, the range the range five object gets created before the loop is executed. And then in every iteration of the loop, a new number is created. So we have a lot of less memory usage in this, in this formulation. And then of course, if I execute this, I also loop over the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, just as if I looped over them in the list. But again, the second version is a lot more memory efficient. And in a way, it's also syntactic sugar, but it's not really syntactic sugar because the range type, it really gives us a new functionality, which means uh, to loop over something that doesn't exist in memory yet. So what does the five mean? Well, the five means give me back five integers. And as we start counting at zero in Python, the first number we get out of it is zero. And the last number and that's also common in Python is not included. So that is why range five gives, gives us five numbers starting at zero and then excluding the five, of course. So the, what, is, what is range five? Well, it's of type range object. Again, um, as I said, it's an object in memory that um, all it does is it knows how to calculate new integer objects without calculating that. And the for loop basically forces the range object to spit them out one by one. That's what, how it works. So now in some special scenarios, we may want to loop over numbers in a different pattern. Let's say, for example, I want to loop over the numbers one to 10 and jumping over every second number. And that's why the 10 is left out here. So um, how do I do this? Well, I could write out the list. I could write one, three, five, seven, and nine. I could loop over this and it works. So I loop over them, I print them out. How could I do, could I do this with, uh, with range? Well, I provided a, a start value, which is one now. If I don't provide a start value, as we've seen, the start value is set to zero. But here I want to start um, I want to start looping over the number one and I want to 
um, loop until 10, but excluding 10. So the, the lower limit is always included, the upper limit is always excluded. And then the third argument is called the step size. So I want to get every other element. So this range object gives me back the same sequence of numbers. But again, the upper version generates a list object with references to five different int objects. So there are six different objects in memory at the same time down here as we only have at most two objects in memory at the same time. A one range object and then only in every iteration of the for loop we get a new integer object that is forgotten immediately after the loop is over. So the second version again is a lot more memory efficient. So the thing here, maybe I'll go back here, the thing that you should ask is, well, wait a minute, if you have any experience with some other programming languages, you may know that you know, it's not so common that in other programming languages you can loop over different types of things. So in particular here I loop over a list object and here I loop over what we, what we saw to be a, a range object. So it's two objects of different types. And whenever I loop over something of a different type, the question you should ask is, why does this work? Um, so obviously the for loop does not require um, the, the object to be looped over to be a list. In particular, it does not require the object to loop, to loop over to be anything, any, any specific object. The only thing it requires is that the object is being able to be looped over. And that is the definition of what in Python is called an iterable. That's the technical word. Iterable means any object that has a type or is of a type that can be looped over is by definition an iterable. A similar concept is the concept of a container. And what a container means is basically any object that holds references to other objects. It, so to say it contains other objects. And these are two different attributes that any type may have or may not have. And oftentimes they coincide as we will see, but they are different concepts. And um, let's see an example. And what I'm about to tell you is similar to the discussion of callables in the functions chapter. And remember that back in the chapter on functions, I defined a callable to be any type that we can call. And then we saw three different types that can be called, namely a built-in function, we saw the constructor, and then we saw the user-defined function. So three different concrete examples of what is callable. And callable, again, is the abstract concept, the thing that in abstract sense, the three different op uh, types share. And just like here, just like um, the difference between the abstract concept and the concrete type back then, we also do this the same or similar type of analysis here. So the example goes like this. We create a list. The list now is called first names and it holds five German names. And now I can ask the question, hey, is the, the name Achim in the list of first names? And note, we have not seen this before. Um, I left out the four here, so it does not say for Achim in, but it just says Achim in first names. So what is in here? Well, in is an operator. So it's not the for statement here. So the in in this in this example has a different syntactic meaning. It means uh, it's an operator. It's basically just like the plus sign in a way. The plus sign, the minus sign, and the modulo division, all these or the, the parentheses when we call when we call something, these are all operators. And just like they are all operators, the in we should also view it as an operator. And what does the in operator do? Well it checks if the left-hand object is contained in the right-hand object. And in other words, it's a Boolean expression. It gives us back a true or false if the left-hand side is contained in the right-hand side. And in this case, this is true. And then, of course, if I check another name, for example, Alexander, this is not included in first names. And uh, the in operator that, uh, that is shown here is the characteristic operator of what is of everything that is considered a container in Python. So whenever we can ask the question, does something contain something else? Whenever we ask this question, the, 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 the thing that contains other things is called a container, and that's an abstract thing. Um, and the list, a Python list object, is a container. 
it's one example of a particular container. We will also see other examples and I can already give you away one more example. So for example, um, the, the text string Achim, as we saw here, here's just Achim. This itself is also a container because we can ask the question, is the letter, let's say lowercase a in Achim? And the answer is of course false. But if I ask the question, is the uppercase letter a in Achim? Then the answer is true. So not only is a list, so the, the brackets, not only are lists containers, but strings itself, they are also containers. And we'll see many, many more examples. And, but the important idea is that the fact that the, the fact that the in operator works only relies on the type, um, only on the property of being a container. It does not rely that the right-hand side is a list or a, a string or something. It only relies that the right-hand side supports the, the container property. So it's an abstract uh, concept here. And then similar um, to the container property, there is the uh, so-called iterable property. And iterable, all it means is, it asks the question, can we loop over it? Can we loop over something? And whenever we can loop over something, for example, with a for loop, but also with a while loop, um, whenever we can loop over something, um, then we say it's an iterable. So here, I can, of course, loop over first names. Now, this seems trivial, but I'm, I'm not emphasizing the for loop here, and I'm, and I'm not emphasizing the, the fact that this is a list here. I'm emphasizing the, the, um, the property of being iterable. And we will also see other things that are iterable. Maybe I give you another example already, just to make the point. So we've seen the name Achim. The question is, can I iterate over the name Achim? And the answer is for character in Achim. And then I write uh, print character, and let's end it with an empty string. And it also works. So I can also iterate over a text string. And that's important to know. So uh, I can not only iterate over lists, I can iterate over many, many different things, among which are also strings. And when I iterate, when I loop over strings, I loop over the individual characters. So we have seen both lists, but also text strings. They are both containers and they are both iterable. And now you may wonder, well, doesn't this go together? And the answer is, Yes, most of the time, those two properties, they go together. But then the question to ask here, for example, is uh, another question to ask is, uh, when I loop over something, for example, I loop over the character, do I loop in order? In order? So does the A come before the C and so on? And the answer is for strings, yes, there is an order. And for a list, there is an order too. So Achim in the list comes before Berthold. So being, uh, having an order is also a property. And we will see things that we can loop over, so iterables, that are not ordered. And uh, so the, the important idea here is I want you, in the, in the past couple of weeks, I uh, told you the story like this. I said something is anything is an object in Python, and every object has a type. And the type tells us what behavior the object supports. So in other words, we used types to classify objects, right? To ask the question, what can they do, what can they not do? Now we look at types and we try to classify the types. And when we classify the types, then what do we classify them into? Well, this is what I mean in my lecture here by abstract concepts. So just as we classify objects into types, we classify types into, into uh, abstract concepts. And two concepts that we learned in this chapter today are the concepts of being a container and the concept of being an iterable. But there are many, many more concepts to come. And we've all also seen one other concept before, which is the concept of callable. So why, why do I teach this? Well, I told you that one of the goals that I have by teaching you um, abstract concepts is to answer the question, does this help you? Does knowing the concept help you to read the documentation in a better way? So for example, let's go to the enumerate built-in. Enumerate takes, as we see, a so-called iterable. And what does it do? It returns an enumerate object. We don't know what this is, but iterable must be a sequence. Sequence is another such a word, an iterator or some object which supports iteration. So it's very abstract here. 
And uh, I want you to, at the end of the course, be able to read this documentation and understand it. And so, uh, as you can see, the word iterable here is important. So we want to call enumerate with an iterable. And we have learned that now um, a list like first names is an iterable. So we can pass enumerate an iterable like first names. And then what enumerate does, it uh, instead of looping over only the elements of the list, so only the names in this example, we get a second variable, which is an index. So whenever I use i, the chance is very high that uh, the variable is supposedly an index variable. And if I execute the next code cell, what I do is, for every iteration of the loop, I get now two variables, namely first an index i and second a name. So the index uh, zero points to Achim because it's the first element in the list, one points to Berthold because it's the second element and so on. And we can also use the start, um, the start um, uh, keyword here by and, and specify, let's say, start equals to one. And then we can start counting with the index variables at one. So enumerate, um, it only it helps us to get us an index variable. In other words, going back to the original while example that we had a little bit earlier today, I told you that the for loop is nothing but syntactic sugar for a while loop. And in the while loop, we used an index variable. And usually the rule is this, whenever you want to use an index variable in Python, most likely you're doing something wrong because Python makes it very easy to loop over things without an index variable. However, in the rare cases where you still need an index variable, you can easily get one, you can always get one by just using the enumerate built-in because the enumerate building can just be put around everything about, of, about anything that we can loop over and it will give us back whatever we are looping over anyways, the name, but also an index variable. So it's a very cheap of, uh, a thing to do to always get an index variable, but usually you don't need the index variable. So in the rare cases where you need it, um, always use the enumerate and I don't want you to see uh, I don't want to see you to uh, manage your own index variable to do something, just as we did with the while statement. Whenever you do this, chances are pretty high that you will mess up the code. You will, you know, mess up the index variable. You will have a one by an, an off by one error or something. So it's always easier to loop without index variables by using a for. And in the rare case where you do need uh, an index variable, for example, for printing an out or something, um, then just use enumerate. So let's go on. Now that we know what the for statement is and how the for statement works. Let's look at some other examples and rewrite them from the recursion ver recursive version into a looping version, an iterative version. So let's look at Fibonacci numbers again. So remember the big problem we had with Fibonacci was that we tried to calculate the Fibonacci numbers from right to left and this resulted in an exponential growth in function calls. So that was bad. So the easier way would of course be to calculate the Fibonacci numbers from left to right. So let's do this. How do we do this? Well, we just write a new Fibonacci function. We also put in now some input validation because we now learned how to do this. And then down here, we put the entire logic. So how do we calculate the, the highest Fibonacci number? Let's say for example, the 13th Fibonacci number. Um, how can we do this? Well, we do it like this. We have two variables a and b. We set them to zero and one. Why? Why do we set them to zero and one? Well, because zero and one are by definition the first two Fibonacci numbers. They are given. There is nothing to be calculated here. And then we um, we loop from left to right. And how often do we have to loop? If we want to uh, calculate the 13th Fibonacci number, then i would be what? i would be 12, right? Because the 13th Fibonacci number, we start counting at zero, so i would be 12. So how often do we have to loop? Well, in this example, um, we would have to loop 11 times. Why? Because we already have the first two Fibonacci numbers. So in other words, in order to calculate the 13th Fibonacci number, if we are already given the first two by definition, we only have to calculate 11 more Fibonacci numbers. This is, how, this is what explains the range and the i minus one here. And then uh, what we also see here in the for loop is an underscore, and that's a convention. That means whatever we are looping over, so the numbers 0, 1, 2, and 3, because that's what the range spits out, we don't need. And whenever we loop, whenever we get back some variable and we don't really need it, well, then it's a good idea 
to just, so to say, throw it away. And the convention to do that in Python is to use an underscore. So don't be confused by the underscore. The underscore just means the variable here is not really useful. So we don't need it in the body here. And then also note that the print here, the, the, the two print, uh, print function calls here, I only put them in so that we can see intermediate results. So we can actually pretend that the print and this print here, that they are not there. This is just to print intermediate results. And then what do we do in the for loop? Well, we do basically what we just did in the beginning when we went um, the, when we, when we went from left to right and calculated the Fibonacci numbers in our heads. So with A being zero and B being one, how do we calculate the next Fibonacci number? Well, the next Fibonacci number would be just A plus B, right? Because every Fibonacci number is just the sum of its two predecessors. So the next number would be a plus b. And here, what I do is I store the next number, the next Fibonacci number as temp. And what do I do then? Well, then I set a to b. So I set my 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 second predecessor to b, so the first one. And then I, I set b to temp. So what do I do here really? Well, what the for loop really does is it takes the two last Fibonacci numbers, starting with zero and one in the first uh, in the first iteration of the loop. It calculates the next one and then it resets a and b to to be the current one and then one before so this way um, we always we go ahead from left to right and we always um, calculate the next sum in line the next sum and again if if for example we want to calculate the 13th Fibonacci number given the first two numbers by assumption we only have to iterate 11 more times and then the b at the end uh, that remains after the for loop must be the Fibonacci number we look for. So let's see if the function works. I define it. And now I call Fibonacci of 12 again, which is the 13th Fibonacci number. And I get back 144 as before. And now here we see the result of all the prints that I put into the function here, the print here and the print here. I see all the Fibonacci numbers from left to right in increasing order. And um, yeah, that's um, so. In, in other words, if I calculate Fibonacci from left to right, I don't have the problem that I run into exponential growth of function calls. In fact, I don't even have many function calls. I only have one function call because I don't see any call to itself here, right? This is not a recursive version. This is an iterative version. So there are no more, there's only one function call. And um, that's it. And now let's, um, So let's uh, go ahead here and look at um, what happens in the Fibonacci call in the recurse in the iterative version. So let's go back to Python Tutor. And here I copy pasted the function that you just saw, including the print. And uh, let's run it. So what happens here is I create the function first. I create the Fibonacci name pointing to the function object. And then I call it I call the function with i set to five. And what happens inside the function call now? Well, a and b are set to zero and one, right? And then the loop starts. And then also the zero and one are printed out here, but that's only for, you know, intermediate output. And then uh, the for loop starts to run and the underscore, I told you, we just ignore it, right? So whatever is here in the underscore, let's just ignore it, we don't need this. And then we calculate temp. What is temp? Temp is the next Fibonacci number in line. So zero, A is zero, plus B is one, is temp is equal to one, right? And then I go ahead and I change A to one. So the A comes from the B. So the previous B now becomes A and temp then becomes B. And because B and temp were both one, we don't see it. Then I go and then I print it out, the print one, and then I go in the next iteration of the loop. The underscore was changed. I, I ignore it, I don't care. And now temp will be two. Why? Because one plus one is two, the next Fibonacci number. And now I set A to the previous value of B, which I don't see because one and one are the same. And then I take the two here and put it in place of B. So here, and that's it. And then I print it of course, but um, then I go in the next for loop, in the next iteration. And then uh, temp will be three, why three? Well, one plus two is three. And then the two from the B will move to the A position. And then the three from the temp will move to the B position. And then in the next iteration of the loop, 
I can just add two and three to get five again. So this is how Fibonacci works. And this is how we see that there's only one function call in memory. And we only keep track of the last two Fibonacci numbers. And, we, and by only keeping track of the last two Fibonacci numbers, we are always able to just calculate the next one. And then we, we, we uh, reset the two numbers that we uh, keep track of. And then we can calculate the next one and so on. So this is a very uh, almost trivial way to calculate Fibonacci numbers. And then once the function is over, it returns five. That's the result. And we see up here the print output is just debug information. So the actual result would be five. Okay, let's go back to the script. And uh, that's um, the, the iterative version of Fibonacci, way more efficient. And now, of course, we can contrast this with the uh, recursive version. So Fibonacci, the 100 Fibonacci number back with the recursive version that we saw before, we could not calculate this. But now if I calculate Fibonacci uh, of 99, so the 100 Fibonacci number in the iterative version, it works. It's a very big number. Um, we see that Fibonacci grows very rapidly, but at the end of the day, it took no time to calculate it. Okay, uh, one more time, let's look at the factorial example. And let's also calculate from left to right. So how do we do how do we do that for the factorial? Well, first we update the doc string. We put in the input validation um, down here. We can assume that n is definitely non-negative. So um, n is um, yeah n is basically um, allowed to be zero here, but this doesn't uh, have any negative effect down here. And then we do this. We we set product equal to one. And why do we do this? Well, because zero faculty uh, factorial uh, factorial of zero is defined to be one that's why we set the product of one and then we loop over we we write a for loop and then all we do is we update the product we um, we loop over a variable called i and i starts to be at one and then we loop up until uh, n plus one and why do we, why do i write n plus one here well we know that in the range built in the left hand side, the start value is included and the right hand side, the n plus one is not included. So if I want to calculate, let's say n factorial, so let's say three factorial, I want to go and calculate one times two times three. So I want to include three. So therefore I just write n plus one, I make it one bigger so that the n in my example three uh, would also be included. So if n were three, I would run through the for loop exactly three times for one, for i is one, for i is two and for i is three. And then three times I would just update the product by just taking product times the current product uh, times the next number to, to multiply by. So what I do here is effectively in the recursive version of factorial, I calculated the factorial from right to left. So uh, three factorial would be uh, calculated as three times two times one, which is six. And now I do it in a forward way. So three factorial here would now be one times two times three. So I just changed the order. I calculate from left to right, but nothing else changes. And the nice thing here is if I do it in the forward way, I can also put in a print, uh, a call to the print function here. And um, so I can also uh, track the intermediate um, output, the intermediate product. Conceptually, what we do here is in the very first example in the first chapter, we uh, calculate a so-called running total, right? Remember? What, what, what I do here is I calculate a running product, so to say. So it's kind of kind of very similar here. Let's define the function and let's see if it works. Factorial of, let's say, let's use, use something smaller. Let's use the factorial of three. It will be one times two uh, times three. And then here we see the intermediate results. So factorial of one, factorial of two, factorial of three. So if I calculate factorial of 10, just as it said before, um, the factorial also grows very fast. And uh, the tenth number here, the tenth iteration of the loop is the return value as well. So um, yeah, that's it. That's calculating the factorial from left to right. Okay, so what have we done so far? Today we've learned the recursion, we have learned the while statement and then the for statement. And I told you that the for statement, we really didn't need to learn, right? Um, the for statement is syntactic sugar for the while statement. And just as the for loop is syntactic sugar for the while statement, I will show you for the remainder of this lecture today some more syntactic sugar um, that makes working with the for loop even nicer.
for example, the break statement. So let's look at the following example. I will give you shortly um, a list of numbers that you already know, the numbers from 1 to 12, unordered. And I ask the question, can you tell me if at least one number in this list of number has a square that is above 100? So that's the example. So let's look at the code. Here is the numbers list that you know from the very first chapter on. And the question again is, is any number in there whose square is greater than 100? How could I write code that checks for this? Here's a first example using only constructs in Python that you know about. So what does the code do? First, I, I set a um, variable threshold to 100. That's the value I want to check for. So I want to check is any square of the number of any number in here greater than 100. Then I uh, initialize a so-called indicator variable called is above to false. So I saw my, my basic assumption is no number is greater than 100 or no numbers square is greater than 100. That's my assumption here. And then I loop over all the numbers and I print them. The printing is only there so that we can follow the code as it runs. And then I do this. I take the square of the number and I check is it's bigger than threshold. If so, I set the indicator variable to true. So um, yeah, so whenever I find a, a, a number whose square is greater than 100, I set the is above um, variable to true. And at the end, there is a third section, so to say, in this code cell, which only checks is above true or is it false? And depending on if above is true or false, um, the output will be either at least one number square is above 100 or no number square is above 100. Let's execute this code. And of course, the answer is at least one number square is above 100. And uh, it's the number 11, for example, but also 12. And uh, 100 would not be the case because it's exactly 100 and that's not strictly greater than 100. So. What is the problem with this code? There are two problems. The first one is a real problem. The second one is a, uh, a problem that uh, has to do with code style and code beauty and readability. So the first, the real problem is this. Even though the 11, the second element in the list is greater, has a square that is greater than 100, I run to the end of the list. So independent, on us knowing the result of the calculation already after the second of 12 elements, we have to do the calculation for all the 12 elements in the list. That's inefficient. So our calculation has takes 10 steps that are totally not necessary. That's a, that's a big problem. Imagine this list were a billion numbers big, right? So this would take a very long time. And then the second problem that I have with this code is the code conveys one idea. It should convey one idea because it's like the, the question is, um, you know, what's the task? The task here is to check if at least one number is greater than uh, 100. And but what I do here is I have to write three sections, three conceptually different sections in the code. So at first I have to initialize some variables. I need them. Without them, I couldn't run this. Then I run the actual for loop and the actual logic that does the checking. And then I have a third section that only checks what was the result and has a different um, output message. So the code is separated into three different sections, even though I only do one thing really. I'm only checking if one number is has a square that is greater than 100. So I'm checking only one thing, but I, ha I have three conceptual steps here and I don't like that. So the message of what the, the program does is actually is not so easy to see. So how can we do it? How can we improve on those two things that we don't like? The first one is very simple. So the first time I see a number whose square is greater than 100, I already know. I already know that um, I don't have to go to the end. So what I can do here is I, I set is above to true. And then I write the word break. Break is a statement. And what it does, it, it breaks out of the for loop. So whenever Python hits a break, it checks inside which loop it is, the closest loop inside in the most enclosing loop inside it is, and it breaks out of it. In other words, if I run this cell, we see after we hit the 11 in numbers, uh, we stop looping. 
So that's an improvement. So our runtime is a little bit better, at least um, uh, at least on average. Now, if I have one thousand, if I check if the number, if the square of a number of at least one number is above one thousand, I still go to the end. So, but again, if I have, if I check for a square of a number who is who fulfills the condition, then I might exit the loop um, earlier. So I have improved one aspect of the code. And now let's improve another one. And uh, I do this by introducing another concept in Python that does not exist in many other languages. It's called the for else clause. And we know else clauses already. Um, else clauses go together usually with an if statement. But if we look at this example here, what we see here is I still have my initializing up here. So I still set threshold to 100. But I don't set is above here. So I, I skipped this. This was there before. So if I go back, there is a is above here. This is now gone. So I have uh, eliminated 50% of my initializing code. And um, then I loop over numbers. And then I check again. And I, I set the is above variable to true if I find at least one number whose square is above 100. And I break out of it. And then I say I see the word else, and usually else goes with an if, but note the indentation is correct here. So for and else, else they go together. It's on the same level of indentation. It's not this here. We don't have this here. On purpose we have this. And what the else clause does, it is only executed if I run to the end of the loop. In other words, whenever I go to the loop to, to the, through the entire for loop, and I don't go and I don't hit the if statement, if I don't hit the break statement here, if I don't enter the if condition, only then do I go into else. So that means, conceptually speaking, the else here still goes together with the if here. Syntactically speaking, the else goes together with the for. Conceptually speaking, the else here goes together with the if here. So either I am in this clause, or I'm in this clause. I cannot be in both clauses when in at the same time. It doesn't work in the same run of the cell. So, and, and that is why I can uh, initialize, or I don't have to initialize the is above variable. I can put the is above equals true and the is above equals false right either here or here. If I run the cell, I get the same output as before. After I check the 11, I know that a square is above 100. If I put 1000 here, I run to the end and it says no number square is above 100. So the code is still correct. However, it's a little bit nicer now in that uh, I don't have to initialize this indicator variable before. And now the question is, how can I make this code even nicer? Well, I don't like this ending part here. I would preferably like this thing to be in the for statement as well. How do I do that? Well, it's very easy. I just copy paste the print um, the calls to the print function inside the if and the else clauses. And I break out here. So in this case, what I do is I eliminated the need for the um, is above indicator variable. I don't need this indicator variable. And technically speaking, I also don't need the threshold 100 here. I could hard code it either here. If I, you know, have, if I could afford hard coding it, or I could um, parameter parameterize the this into this logic into a function, for example, but this isn't really uh, initializing code here. This is just um, what I'm looking for. So now, why is this code nicer? Well, first, it's nicer because it still has the break, so it's still efficient. It still does not go to the end once it hits uh, an element that fulfills the condition. And second, um, I convey now the idea that this statement, the for else statement, it goes together. So now I convey the idea to the reader of the code that this is really just one thing I'm doing. It's one task. I'm looking for one number in one list. It's not three steps. I'm only doing, I'm, I'm doing one operation, conceptually speaking. So this co code in the long run will be a lot uh, more readable. And again, the else uh, clause doesn't exist for four statements in many, many languages, but in Python it does. And uh, I think it's a very nice uh, thing to know how to use it, especially uh, if you also know how to use the break statement. And uh, this makes um, writing for loops that search something and searching something in a sequence of something is a, a common a theme that, we, that you will do when programming. And um, this makes searching something very easy. Okay, 
let's do um, let's review another statement that is related kind of to the break statement but it's basically a, um, a different statement it's kind of like the opposite almost so to do that i introduce another example um, it's an example that we have seen similarly before in the first chapter so let's do this let's look at the numbers from uh, 1 to 12 in an unordered fashion so it's the same list of numbers that you're used to and the task is this i should calculate the sum of all even numbers, so that, that's something we've heard before, after squaring them and adding one to the squares. So again, it's not just taking the uh, calculating the average of all even numbers in the list, it's um, calculating something out of the numbers after changing them, after adapting them, after transforming them. So let's take this sentence apart, the task. So whenever you read the word all, there's a good chance that whatever you need to do in code is you have to loop. So in this case, we look at all the numbers in the list. So we have to loop over a list. That's what the translation means. Even, um, it says calculate the sum of all even numbers. Even basically means we have to filter something out. In this case, we have to filter out the odd numbers. We have to do something only for numbers that remain after filtering. And then what, what it says here, it says, after squaring them and adding one to the squares. So that basically means I shall not only just sum up the numbers that remain after filtering, but I have to transform the numbers first and then sum them up. And this has a technical term. Whenever you transform all the elements in a list before you do something, you call this a map. And a map in, is just a fancy programming word for a function. So what we do here is square and add one basically means take an X square it at one and that's your y. In other words, it's a parabola, right? It's the, the function y is f of x is x squared plus one. And uh, so it's nothing that you shouldn't know from math. You know how to do transformations or maps um, from early in your math education in high school. So that's what a map is. And then at the end, after we filtered out the numbers and after we transformed or mapped some of the elements, the remaining elements, what we do is in this case, in this example, we sum up all the remaining and map numbers um, into one number. And whenever you take many, many elements and you basically summarize them into one number or into one element, then what you effectively do is uh, what is called reducing. So these are the three technical terms here, filter, map, and reduce. And um, most of the things you do in programming when you work with data, um, most of the operations you do in programming goes back um, into one of those three um, bigger ideas. It's either a filtering of something, let's say, um, let's say you have um, some, let's say sales data from a company and you want to filter out days um, that had some extraordinary event. Let's say you want to filter out maybe Christmas Eve because on Christmas Eve your, your company didn't sell anything because it was closed. So you want to filter out the outlier, right? So filtering out outliers is a very common theme. Uh, transforming something or mapping something is also in a business context very um, often done. So for example, imagine you have uh, a company, a big company that operates in many, many countries and uh, the sales data from one country is reported in, let's say, Czech Krona and in another country the, or in your main currency is, Europe, is, is, is the Euro. So maybe you want to transform all your Czech Krona sales data into Euro. Okay, that's mapping. And then at the end, you want to reduce something. Um, let's say you have individual sales, all the sales uh, of all the um, individual orders of a day. And let's say you want to aggregate your data into uh, sales by day or sales by week or sales by month or sales by quarter or something like this. These are typical reduction um, steps. So filtering, mapping and reducing. These are three steps that um, are usually very helpful to think uh, of. And um, there's a nice side benefit whenever you are able to, um, um, to break down whatever your programming task is into these three different steps, then it's very easy to build software that scales to uh, um, really big data that doesn't fit into a single machine because the filter map reduce paradigm is really a paradigm as to how to organize big amounts of data when you do calculations in an efficient way. So let's see the example in code. So we see numbers again, the numbers that we know. 
And what do we do here? What I do here is I initialize again a variable called total. We've done this before. Then I loop over all the numbers. And then I say if number um, modulo divided by 2 equals 0, so if the number is even, that's basically what the if statement here says, then what I do is I take the number, I square it, I add 1 to it, and then I add the square to the total, to the running total. And I have a print, um, a call to the print function inside here so that we see intermediate results. So let's execute this. And what I see here is um, the 7 is an, is an odd number, so we filter it away. We don't keep it. The, the 11 is an odd number, we filter it away. The 8 is the first even number we see. And uh, the 8 is then squared, and then we add 1, so we get 65. So it's mapped. So the 8 is mapped to 65. We do this for all the numbers in here. And then once we have the, the numbers like filtered and mapped, we just reduce them by, in this case, by just summing them up and we get 370. So that's a typical, you know, um, use case of the map filter reduce paradigm. So now what happens if you have several filters? And that's a typical use case. So let's look at the example and adapt it a little bit. And it says, calculate the sum of every third and even number after squaring them and adding one to the square. So the only thing that changes now in this example is that is that we have two filters, right? We have we have to filter for every third element only, and we also um, only we only filter uh, for the even number. So we filter out the odd numbers here, and the rest remains the same. So how do we do this in code? Very easy. Well, let's first take the numbers and then write a for loop, and let's use the enumerate built-in that we just learned of as today. And enumerate gives us an index variable. So in this way, I can loop over numbers on a one by one basis but i don't only loop over the number itself but i also get the index variable and now the, the task says um, filter away all the numbers or only keep the numbers that is every third number and only keep the even numbers in other words the seven and the eleven we don't even look at the eight we will look at because it's the third number the sixth number we look at the ninth number we look at the twelfth number we look at because we only look at every third number right and how do we check if a number is the third number, well, if the index variable divided by three has no rest. So in other words, we enumerate all the numbers, we start the enumeration by one or at one, and then whenever i modulo divided by three is equal to zero, we know we have reached a third number. We have reached number three, right, number six, number nine, number 12, and so on. Then we have the second filter. Um, the second filter means we are indented. We have one level of indentation more and um, what we do here is um, I ch check if number divided by two has no rest. That means we only keep the even numbers, right? And then we go ahead and do what we did before. We square the number, we add one to it, and we sum up all the squares. So if I execute this line of code, the first number that is kept is the eight, it is mapped to 65. The next number that is mapped is the 12. Why? Because it's the sixth number and it's even and it's mapped to 145. And the next number that is, uh, um, that is kept is the four, it's the last element. So the nine, the number nine here is not kept. It's, it, it may be a third number, it's the ninth number here, but it's not even. So it does not fulfill both filters, right? So uh, that's why it's filtered out. But the learning is we can add many, many more filters. We can add as many filters as we want. Every filter we want to add is just another if statement, right? There is one problem with this approach though. For every if statement we put in there, our code, the, the, um, the code block here, moves further to the right. And you see this right dotted line here in my Jupyter Notebook. That is the line that says here it's uh, 80 characters. And you remember the rule that we don't want to write more than 80 characters on a line. And we do this not because uh, you know we don't have any space on, on our big screens these days, but we do this to keep the code uh, readable. That's a, a measure to make sure that the code does not grow into too complex code that we cannot read anymore. And also people, especially programmers, tend to like code or to read code um, preferably from um, top to bottom and not from left to right. So we only want to keep our code as narrow as possible or as far to the left hand side as possible. So how do we do this? If we, Let's say if we want to add a third or a fourth filter, what would happen is in this uh, scenario, the code would just move further to the right. So what could we do instead? 
Instead, what we could do is this. We can write the same for loop and then instead of checking if a condition is fulfilled, so here we check if the, if the condition is fulfilled, instead we check for the opposite, we check if the condition that we want to filter for is not fulfilled, and then what, and then what we do is we write the word continue. So basically how this reads is, if the index variable i is not divisible by 3, then continue. And what does the continue do? Well, if we're inside one iteration of the for loop, the continue just jumps into the next iteration of the for loop. And then the same is true for the for the elif uh, case here. So I say, if the number is not even, then continue, the, continue with the next number. So basically what, what we do here is, we, uh, we, we filter out all the cases, all the numbers that we do not want to add. In other words, down here, where is the body of the entire transformation, um, this body is only executed for numbers that survive the filtering, so for numbers that we want to keep. In other words, now adding new filters becomes very easy because all we do is for every filter we want to add, we only add one more elif clause and a continue, and then we can add as many filters as we want and our code does not grow to the right-hand side. If I execute this uh, code cell, I get, of course, back the exact same result as before with just the ben side benefit that the code looks probably a lot better, at least in my eyes. I think from a beginner's point of view, you might ask yourself the question, you know, why can I not leave code like this? Well, of course, in the beginning you can, you absolutely can if you're still learning, but in the long run, you should aim for code that uh, looks a, a lot more nicer and is a lot more readable even for yourself. And one of the rules that we learned to keep code readable is to just not cross the red dots here and uh, to keep the code as far to the left as possible and the continue statement may be helpful to do. Also, when you read the code, not only does it not go to the right, it's also easier to read conceptually here because up here I have all the filters and I know um, if any of the filter applies, then the number will be skipped. And then I know down here for all the numbers that are not skipped, we do the following. So it's a lot easier to read also from top to bottom here. Okay, but again, uh, both the break and also the continue statement, they have no new functionality. So they are also only syntactic sugar. And now let's come to the last subsection of today's lecture. And it's a lecture that I titled indefinite loops. So we have seen infinite loops before. That was the example of collets where we didn't know or we couldn't prove if a function would actually return ever. And now uh, we basically look at a similar type of looping, but it's a, a loop where we don't know when it will finish. So it will finish, we, we know that for sure, but we don't know when, that's indefinite. And when would you use an indefinite loop? Well, for example, when you deal with user input, let's say, let's play the following game we will model a coin toss, so um, heads or tails, from some, some fair coin, which has a 50-50% chance to, to reach either side. And then we have user input, and the user tries to guess what the computer, uh, what the computer simulation uh, threw or tossed. And um, so the following game is random. And it's random for two sources. With well, the first source, of course, the coin toss is random. The second source of randomness is the user because we don't know what the user of our program will guess. And depending on the user guessing the coin toss correctly, the program will finish. And if the coin toss is not guessed correctly, then the user will just get another chance to, to, uh, to guess the coin toss. And of course, another chance meaning there's a new coin toss and it starts all over again. So that's why this game um, is kind of like a loop that will end, we know for sure it will end, but we don't know when. We don't know uh, when the user is able to guess the coin toss correctly. So let's see how can we build such a game. First of all, we will import the random module from the standard library. And then just for good practice, we will set a random seed. Remember that the random seed it's basically kind of like the start value of our random sequence of numbers so that whenever we um, execute the following lines of code, the random numbers that are drawn will be the exact same numbers. This is uh, important for uh, being able to reproduce uh, some uh, simulation or some analysis. Okay, let's go on and let's see 
how does an indefinite loop look like? So first of all, we will use a while loop because for a for loop, we will always know how long it will run. But for a while loop, we can actually um, uh, write down, uh, down a condition and the condition may be true, it may not be true. But what do we do here? Well, here I write while true colon. So when is while true true? Well, the answer is it is always true. So while true is a, is a uh, pattern that you will see whenever we write a loop that we want to break out later on, but we don't know exactly when we want to break out. So in other words, this uh, block of code better had some break statement somewhere, and it does. Without the break statements here, this loop would indeed run forever, and we don't want that. We don't want an infinite loop, we want an indefinite loop. So what do we do in the first iteration of the loop? We use the built-in input function, which we, as we will see in a, in a moment, we'll just ask a user to type in something, and uh, that is the user's guess. So we will ask the user here, hey, hey user, please guess if the coin come up, came up heads or tails. And then we will store whatever the user wrote, uh, whatever the user entered in the variable called guess. And we can already see that uh, input will basically return it as a string, right? Uh, you can also see this in the documentation, of course, but I, you can also trust me, the input function will return a string. And then what do we do? Then I, I write if random.random .random and call it, is slower, uh, is smaller than 0.5. So what this is, the random.random .random function, as you remember, it will uh, draw a random variable between zero and one, and it's a float. So any number, any any decimal number between zero and one is possible. And all of the numbers between zero and one are uniformly possible. So they are possible with the same probability. So if I know that random.random .random will give me back a number between zero and one uniformly distributed, I know that if the number that I get back is smaller than, let's say, 0.5, this happens with 50% chance. So if I want to model a fair coin toss, I, I just compare random.random .random to 0 0.5. I can, I can say smaller than or greater than 0 0.5. It doesn't really matter. Um, so I chose the smaller, ca uh, smaller than case. And this, basically, this expression that is now uh, highlighted, this models a coin toss, a random coin toss. So in the example here, in the first branch, in the if branch, um, I model a case where the computer um, um, tosses a coin and gets back heads. The else branch does the opposite. This is what is reached when the um, coin toss will give back us tails. So again, Above the if branch is the is what will be executed if we if the computer threw heads and down there is what is what what is executed when the computer threw tails, and then what do we do inside those branches? Well, I, I check if whatever the user entered guess is equal to heads, and if it is, then the user guessed the guessed correctly, and I will print out yes it was heads, and then I will break out of the loop. In the case. Where the user x um, where the user guessed incorrectly, I will just say, "Oops, it was heads." So I will let the user know what I threw, what the computer threw. But um, I will also tell him, "Hey, um, you guessed wrong. Please guess again." And I do the same kind of logic down here with tails. So if the user guessed tails, we we give him a success message saying, "Yes, it was tails," and we break out of the loop. And if the user did not correctly guess the result. Um, we say, oops, it was tails. And because it does not have a break here, what will happen is the loop will start running again. The, the user will have to enter input uh, the guess again, and then the entire game starts all over again. So let's, let's execute this. And now down here, we see this text um, message, which basically says, guess if the coin comes up heads or tails. And I will now enter heads. And uh, let's write it like this, heads. I'm a user, I'm a stupid user, so I just write heads in a capital H. I enter, and then the computer says, oops, it was tails. So I say, well, okay, I had a 50-50 chance of winning the game, so let's guess again. Let's write heads again. And now I enter, and now something interesting happens. The computer says, oops, it was heads, lowercase. So we see our program here, it actually has a bug. Uh, it requires our user to enter heads or tails in a lower case. 
And uh, if the user does not enter this in the lower case, then even if the guess is correct, the computer does not recognize this. So now, uh, knowing this, we write heads in a lower case, enter it, and then all of a sudden it says, oh yes, it was heads. So that's how the game works. We could play it again, uh, but I won't uh, now, because this you know, code needs to be improved. First and foremost, there, uh, we saw we have a bug in it, so we, we need to handle a bug. So um, it should not be important how the user enters the, the solution. And then secondly, there's something else that I don't like about this code. And what I don't like about this code is that this big if else logic, it's actually three if, if, if statements. So it's one outer if statement that models the coin toss. And then we have two inner if statements that model the guess by the user. So two different steps that are independent. So causing the tossing of the coin and also the guessing of the, of the coin toss, they are modeled in the same kind of code fragment, right? And I don't like this. And why don't I like this? Well, if there are two things in the reality that happen totally independent of each other, so throwing a coin is totally different step than asking the user what to guess, then I shouldn't mix this code up in the code because then whenever I do this, what happens is the, the code will at the end of the day be more complex than reality. And I don't like this. Uh, whenever I write code, I want to simplify reality, right? So I want to have a model that uh, it's just good enough, just complex enough to model the reality and be helpful. And um, the code shouldn't be more complex than reality. So what can we do to improve this code? Well, at first we uh, do what is called modularization. So I put in the individual steps into functions on their own. For example, I will first write a function that is called getGuess. And getGuess already tells us what it will do. Uh, first, it does not take any input, but it returns a guess, which is either a string or a none type, so none. So, and it and it goes further. Further, it says either heads or tails if the input can be passed and none otherwise. So, as a user of this function, I already know there are only three possible return values: either I get back heads or tails in lowercase letters, or I get back the special value none. So um, that's it, only three possibilities, not more. So how do we implement this function? Well, first, the first step is exactly the same as before. I ask the user via the input um, built-in function and I store the result as guess. And then I call methods on the guess object. So we remember that in the first chapter already, we used methods and we uh, introduced methods as functions that are attached to an object, right? And different types of objects do have different uh, methods. And string objects have a method that, um, or have several methods. And one of them is called strip. And what dot strip does, it removes white space. So if, for example, a user enters uh, space heads, then this, the leading space character will be removed. And then we call another method called dot lower, and this does. Uh, what we think uh, it should do, it lowercases all the letters in the word. So we know that after the second line, where I say guess is equal to guess.strip.lower, guess will be lowercase, and it will have no white space surrounding it. And then what I do is, I check if the guess that remains is in the list. That's, that's the in operator we saw before, because um, the list here is a container, so that's why the in operator works. So I check if guess is in either lowercase heads or lowercase tails. And if it is, I just return guess as it is. And I know because uh, I know that I can do this because heads or tails in lowercase is exactly what I want to return as per the doc string up here. If, my, if the word that the user entered after the correction is not either heads or tails, then I return none and none indicates the user entered something that is invalid, okay? So that's my first step. The second step is another function and I call it toss coin. And this function simulates the tossing, tossing of a coin. And this takes even a parameter called p hats for the probability to, to model hats and it's defaults to 0 0.5. So by default, we model a fair coin, but we could easily adjust um, the, this argument here in a function call later 
and model a non-fair coin toss a coin toss right so um, by using functions and modular uh, modularizing our code into functions we already see one big advantage and the big advantage is we can um, easily parameterize things so like for example the probability to 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 throw heads and then what we do is we compare random dot random we, we still draw a random variable and we compare it to just p heads so in other words p heads better be between zero and one we don't check we don't have an input validation here but you know maybe we, we should put an input validation here i, I left it out here but uh, we know that p hat should be between zero and one but it also follows from the from the description because prob probabilities can only be between zero and one and then if random.random .random returns a random number that is smaller than whatever the p hats is, I just return the word hats. In the other case, I return the word tails. So to reiterate what we learned in the beginning of this chapter, this is another example of the early exit pattern here. So um, after the return hats, there is no else because I can, you know, uh, after the return here, I, I'm already out of the function call. So uh, I can just write return tails without the else here. That's it. And now I have to clue those two functions together. How do I do that? Well, I do that in a while loop. So I say while true as before. So I have an indefinite loop. And then I do this. I call get guess and I store the result as guess. After the first line of code, I already know that guess is either heads or tails or none. There is no other possibility. And then in the second step, I toss the coin and I store the result um, in the result variable. I know from the doc string, from this function, from TossCoin, that uh, result here is either uh, guess, uh, is either heads or tails. So for, the, for guess I have three possibilities, for result I have two possibilities. And I know that two of the three possibilities are always the same. So I check here in the first if statement with if guess is none, I check if guess is somehow invalid. And what I do then is I print a nice error message to the user, I say, make sure to enter your guess correctly. So it's a wrong, it's a, it's, a, it's a simple message letting the user know, okay, please enter something that um, I can accept. And then I say in the next line, if guess is equal to result, then I know it's correct. So I can write, yes, it was. And then I just print out result to confirm to the user what he typed. And then of course, I must not forget to break out of the while true loop. Otherwise this would run forever. So that's the case where uh, everything uh, is correct. The user has a correct guess and then we want to stop the game. In the case where the user entered something, um, entered the wrong guess, but a correct guess, then I just print, oops, it was, and I also say result. So um, by, by parameterizing here with, with the variable result, I can only have one message for the, the good case and one message for the bad case and uh, I get back four different uh, messages in total. And also I added the other print in the front. So uh, this code is a lot easier to read. It's a lot more modular and I can easily, in the toss coin function, I could easily adjust p heads and, and can say, hey, it's 0.7 or something. So I can easily um, change the, the, how the program behaves um, by you know, not changing too much code. And then I can go ahead. And that, now let's go ahead and I, I write heads in uppercase letters and it's heads, so it works. So I can now enter heads in uppercase. I can even go ahead, I can put in two spaces and write it in all caps and uh, I don't get an error message because um, the program understands. So let's do it one more time. Uppercase with spaces and still wrong. And how often can this go wrong? And it's tails again. So that's actually... Um, an example of um, this, this is not very likely what just happened because we have tails three times in a row, but let's do it a fourth time. So now it works. So uh, that's uh, the beauty of a random game. So, uh, and no matter what I enter, I can, if I enter something that is invalid, um, then I get the error message. So I can enter now my guess in different ways and uh, the program is very likely to understand whatever I, I enter. And if it doesn't understand, I get the error message. And the logic is a lot more clearer. And that's an example of an indefinite loop. So uh, that's it. That concludes um, today's lecture. It's a little bit longer than usual, but um, it's longer because, see, 
random games. It's a little bit longer because I put uh, the entire chapter into one uh, into one recording, so that I don't have to do a second recording this week. And um, I hope you will still be able to follow um, the recording here. And if not, then uh, contact me. And otherwise, I hope to see all of you in class healthy next week.